for your worship to the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, folks, for that music and singing. Thank you for being here. Praise you, Lord. Yes, thank you. I'm going to be sharing with you this morning about a very important subject. I have available to you extensive notes. I want you to understand when you leave here today, I want there to be no doubt about it. The subject that I'm going to be talking about, I've touched on from time to time. But we have new people who are in our church, and then some of our older people maybe have forgotten. And the topic that I'm going to be talking to you about is one of the most important, most fundamental, if you are a Christian. And hopefully the people who will hear this CD later or the people who will get the notes or the people who will see this video later today or sometime later, they will get, they will get it. So let me just kind of tell you this. I told you last Sunday I was on a mission. Well, I want you to feel a sense of urgency today. A sense of urgency. For what, Pastor? To learn the commandments of Jesus and to obey them. I'm going to stay pretty much on point. I'm going to be very focused. And I want you to understand this, that all of the scriptures, every scripture that I will be citing with the exception of two, will come from the very words of Jesus. Now, I remember several Months ago, I preached a message, and I started off by basically saying to you, if you knew that Jesus Christ was going to be preaching at Memorial Auditorium at 2.30 on a Sunday afternoon, how many of you would probably try to go? Stand in line. I mean, the people can stand outside in the cold at 4 o'clock in the morning just to get into a building later in the day to hear Donald J. Trump talk. Surely Christians can go to some little inconvenience if necessary to hear Jesus. Now, I'm going to move very slowly because I want you to get this. It's so important motivated by love to obey what Jesus said to do. Do you understand if, if what we believe about the Bible is true, and it is, then these scriptures that I'm going to share with you are just as powerful, just as good, just as valuable, just as real as if Jesus Christ stood right here where I am and spoke these things. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay very much on point, but I realize today in the world, hopefully nobody in this church does that. If so, I would almost die. I'm telling you the truth. That there's a mentality in many places in America that they, oh, well, that's just that preacher, you know. That's just what the preacher said. And it kind of goes in one ear and out the other if it gets into the first ear. That's why the Bible says preach the word. Amen? And so I'm going to lay the word on you this morning from the lips of Jesus Christ. Now, the very first scriptures that I'm going to read are so important. And so I want you to get them. If you get these into your heart and in your mind, if this message gets into you, it will change your Christian walk with the Lord. And that's what I want to see. Not people who are just barely making it. You know, a lot of these jokes that you hear about church actually happen in church, but I heard about the fellow who got up and he said, well, if I never make it in, I'm glad I started. I didn't start on this journey just to go a short distance and then just drop out. Amen? <laughs> I want to hear him say, well done. Amen? 
I want to go to the finish. I want to see the, the finish of this. Amen. And I believe that you do too. All right. Um, to save time, I'm not going to give you the scripture locations. We have adequate outlines outside, and I give you all of this. I'm going to share. I'm going to add like Billy Graham, the scripture says. All right. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? I'll come in on that scripture in a little bit, but Jesus, all of these scriptures, all of these scriptures, Jesus said to his followers. He's not talking to sinners or wannabes. All of the scriptures that I'm going to share with you, Jesus spoke them to his followers, to his disciples. If you love me, keep my commandments. Another rendering of that same verse now, nobody here with us, all right? So it's nobody's business what we do here except us. There is a, a difference of opinion based on some resources as to how that word keep should be translated. So I'm going to give you this verse in two different ways. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Either way, either way, it's the words of Jesus, and it's important. Then Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them, and I want you to get this, because what I'm fixing to read to you is a part of the Great Commission. It's the words of Jesus recorded in Matthew's Gospel. It was initially spoken to 11 disciples, but it applies to all us, this, us disciples. And I may comment on this a little bit more in a moment, but what I am doing right now, what I'm doing right now in this service is I am obeying what Jesus instructed them to do, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Now, just in case, Tyler Bogus, or whatever you funny name you know the devil by, and there's nothing funny about him, but just in case he tries to creep up and get on your shoulder, and say, well, now, this is just words that a man said 2,000, over oh, 2,000 years ago, let me remind you that Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. What Jesus said on the banks of Jordan, what he said in the streets of Jerusalem, what he said in Galilee, they're just as real as they are today. Amen? Now let's, let's just uh, uh, settle some, a few things here. The average person Average person, and hopefully people in this church are above average. But the average person, if you talk about Jesus and a commandment or commandments, they don't hear the S immediately. They get a recall. Aha! Jesus said, I give you a commandment that you love one another, so I've loved you. Well, that's not actually what Jesus said. Jesus said, a new commandment I give you a new commandment. Because, see, Jesus knew that prior to that, he had already given them multiple commandments, plural. So Jesus gave commandments to his disciples while he was with them on the earth. Did everybody get that? I'm going to move slowly because, listen, church, this will revolutionize your life. I can tell you that at a point in my life, I became obsessed with Jesus. I wrote a little book, sold it for a dollar in 1970. But I wanted to know about Jesus. I became obsessed with the words of Jesus, everything that he had to say. And the more I learned about what he had to say, the more absorbed I became, the more obsessed, the more I wanted to know what he had to say. And I have shared a lot of those things with you because that's what he wants people to do. So now let me read 
read, these are the only scriptures, these two scriptures are the only scriptures in this message that do not come from the lips of Jesus, but it is a record of what Jesus did. Paul uh, Luke is writing this, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after, after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. So a big deal is made in the Bible, and it's not just in the Gospels, about the words of Jesus, the teaching of Jesus, the doctrine of Jesus, the commandments of Jesus. Now, let's get very focused. Jesus made very specific references to these commandments while he was with the eleven the night before his death. And I know that I've talked about that. I'm going to go out on a limb, and I will risk being redundant, I will risk repeating myself if that's what it takes to jog your memory or to get your brain operating so that you will get this in your heart and in your mind. A lot of the scriptures, several of the key scriptures that I'll be quoting to you, Jesus spoke those in that upper room just before he and his disciples went to the garden and shortly before he was arrested and not too long before he was tried, and within hours he was on the cross. So Jesus had a lot on his mind, but in that city, even knowing that he was going to die within hours, Jesus took time to talk to these men about the commandments that he'd given them. He had some very challenging and concerning things that night to say to these men about the commandments that he'd given them. I want you to think, visualize Jesus standing here in these scriptures that I'm fixing to read to you. These are the actual words of Jesus. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. Now, this I mentioned something about this scripture a little earlier. The Greek texts differ on the form of the verb. So this is why you find it in two different ways. But there's so little difference. It's just that one says, you will do it. The other one says, you better do it. All right? The point is that Jesus makes it clear that if you love him, and I'm not going to ask you if you love him. I'm not going to ask you how much you love him. I'm going to challenge you today to love him and to love him enough to do what he said. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. You're going to hear the word love, and I'm going to talk to you about the word love. I want you to leave here knowing what it means to love Jesus. Amen? It's a lot more than singing. The person who has my commandments and obeys them is the one who loves me. I'm going to fit into that category. I want to live up to that. Amen? One of his disciples made a comment, and Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and take up residence with him. Another translation of that same verse makes it a little clearer. Jesus replied, All who love me will do what I say. Remember the first scripture that I read to you? Jesus spoke these. It was a question to his disciples. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and yet you don't do what I say for you to do? But Jesus says, people who love me will do what I say. Can I just stop for a moment and just do a little bit of Pentecostal middling? I don't know about you, but I am just stirred and disturbed about what's happening in this world. I, I look around here, and, and I, just, I just know that there are people who could be in church today I pray for them every day, and I'm afraid that I pray for them more than they pray for themselves. Church attendance in America today is the lowest it's ever been. You would think that people knowing the Lord's going to come, you would think that they want to be living as close as, he, as they can live and doing as much for them as they ought to. But listen, the Christian church in America is losing its voice. It's losing that influence that it has had for so many centuries. 
I don't know about you, but that concerns me. That concerns about me. You know, Jesus said, if any, if any two of you are gathered in one place, what? I will be in the midst. Anyone who loves me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our abode with them. But now there's a flip side to that. He also said, anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. And remember, my words are not my own. What I'm telling you is from the Father who sent me. Another slight translation of that says, anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. The person who does not love me does not obey my words, and the words you hear is not mine. The Father who sent me, they belong to him. Now, in the aftermath, this same evening, in this same room with this same group of people, Jesus had some very sobering and stirring things to say to these disciples about his commandments and them. Now listen, church, I want you to understand that this is just like Jesus talking to us. So I want you to visualize Jesus right here in this room talking to you. If, if, somebody say if. How many of you know that that's the condition? If you obey my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commandments and remain in his love. You are my friends if, somebody say if, if you do whatsoever I command you. My church, can you imagine, can you imagine what would happen in America? What would you, can you imagine what would just happen in this congregation if every person totally sold out to the Lord and started living their life from this moment forward uh, absorbed, obsessed, committed uh, to find out what Jesus said they ought to be and do and to start doing it, we cannot imagine. It's unimaginable what the results would be. Now, listen to what Jesus said. You are my friends if, if you do whatsoever I say. That word friend there means beloved, dear, devoted, pleasing. If we want to please the Lord, if we want to be acceptable, if we really want to be sold out, devoted, then we're going to have to do what Jesus said. Now listen, church. When I come to the pool every now and then, I hope, Maybe say something of a humorous nature, but when I get to preaching, I am dead serious. Jesus was serious about his words. Jesus was serious about his words, and we should be serious also. Now, I'm going to highlight some things here, but Jesus had a lot to say about his words. I, I'm not going to... You see, if I had more time... <laughs> let's, let's play a little trick here. If I had more time then I would tell you that Jesus spoke 34,450 words in the New Testament. If I had the time, I'd tell you that. One out of five words in the New Testament. Now, I remind you of something that I said to you months and months and months ago. Jesus had a lot to say. And if your memory's not good, you need to write this down. This is not in the outline, or you need to get this CD. Jesus had a lot to say, and he said a lot. And it may surprise you, it may amaze you, and I'm going to give you a little idea here before I finish this message <clears throat> about his words, about his oral ministry. It was very important to Jesus. Now, as we work our way from this point on this message, I want you to think about two words, okay? And they're words that you're very familiar with. Very familiar. The word Lord, L-O-R-D, and the word love. I want you to think about these two words. Let's talk a little bit about the word Lord. As a matter of fact, the last song that was sung in this church, I love you, Lord. Or 
Remember what Jesus said on occasion to his disciples? See, remember that all of these scriptures that I'm reading to you, these are the words of Jesus to his disciples, to his followers. We would call them, they were not known as Christians back then, this is during his ministry on earth. But circumstances were such that he spoke to his disciples and he asked a question. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and yet you do not do what I say? Now, if you were reading the Bible, you'll find that there are very limited occasions when a person's name is repeated. And when it is, it's because something significant is going to follow after it. Simon, Simon, I say unto you, Satan is desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Truly, truly, I say unto you, you must be born again. So these people, they're, they're calling him by the right name, but it's not having the right influence on them. It's just a name. You see, if you were a student of Greek, you do any research at all, you would find right away that right at the very heart of the New Testament word Lord is authority. Somebody say authority. Have you ever had authority? You ever had authority before anybody? I can tell you right now, it's a funny feeling. It's a funny feeling to step out on a highway and you see an 18-wheeler coming down the road at 65 miles an hour. And all of a sudden, you know that you can just raise your hand and he's going to stop. Now, think about, think about this. You see, Jesus is really saying to them, why do you uh, address me as the one who has authority over you while you are unwilling to do what I say and do you? Don't, don't use my name. Don't use my name vainly, irreverently. If you're not going to do as I say do, as you're not going to do what I tell you to do, don't use my name. I made, I made this statement a lot of times, and I made it recently. The thing that's missing in the church world today in America, in the whole concept of worship, is submission. Submission. Oh, we need to be totally committed and submitted to the Lord. And so, let's don't use that word loosely, okay? Remember, it means authority. And I will repeat this perhaps at a point. I know somewhere in this outline I, I wrote this. We may not get to that, but Jesus was in a position to give them commands. Do you understand that? Between law enforcement and the full-time ministry, I worked for a time at a boat factory in my hometown. They're well known in the boating industry. And I was a supervisor. I wore two hats. And of course, in one of my hats, I was the sole person. But in my other hat, I had people who worked for me. I'm hesitant to say under me, but in this particular case, they worked under me. And I had the, I had the loudest uh, employee in the whole company. And he thought that all the company revolved around him. And if the, he were not there, the company would collapse. And so he was carrying on one day, so I just told him. I gave him a directive. And he, he said, who do you think you are? And I said, I'm the man that can fire you. So he carried on one. I said, clock out. He said, you can't tell me to do that. I said, you go talk to Wiley Corbett and you ask him. So when I saw him in a few minutes, he had checked out and he was on the way to get his car. 
I'm, I'm not the kind of person that tries to push my weight around, but I can take a firm stand when I need to. Well, I understand authority. But listen, church, I told you, I told you this for the first several years of my life. I was not a worshiper. I didn't know what the word worship meant. I worship, Lord, oh, oh, I worship. But I found out what worship is. And I also found out something else. Again, I don't expect you to know all of this, but I try to help you from some of the things that I've learned. And in America, known as a Christian nation, there is a big discussion in the theological world between Christian scholars and such about whether or not you can receive Jesus as your Savior and not receive him as your Lord. Now, I'll guarantee that most of you would have the answer to that. Amen, and you don't have three or four initials on the end of your name. I'll guarantee you got enough sense to know <laughs> that Jesus comes as a package deal. Amen? I, I said, how many of you know that he is a package deal? You cannot separate him being a Savior and being Lord. But again, that's the climate that exists in the church world in America. And we wonder why in the world our country is in such trouble. It's not Biden, it's not Trump, it's not Washington. It's the people who sit in the pews because there are enough God-fearing people in this country to turn this country around. If we just got God where he belongs and Jesus where he belongs in our lives. Amen? Now, it's easy to call people Lord. But calling him Lord that does not mean that you're truly acknowledging his authority over you and that you're submitted and committed to obeying what he has said. <clears throat> Remember, I quoted this scripture earlier. It was a, one of my texts, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall never pass away. Do you understand that these scriptures, these things that I am reading to you from Jesus, they're just as real, just as powerful right now as they were at the moment that he spoke. Do you understand that? I'm not going to ask you if it makes sense. That's not the point. The point is that Jesus said them, and he's made it clear that he wants all the people who believe on him to abide by those. Now let's talk about this word love. I've done a lot of preaching since I've been here on love, talked about love. I told you that there in the New Testament word they had four words for love. But of course the one that we want to focus on is what's known as the agape love. Well remember that in our language and in the language of the New Testament the word love is a noun and is a verb. I can say I have love for you or I can say, I love you. I've used the same word, but in two different senses. And so in one case, it's a noun. The other one is, it's a verb. One is something that I possess. The other one is something that I express. There's a world of difference. How many of you know that? You ever said to somebody, well, if you love me, show me? Most of us have. Now, I want to just focus for a few moments on this word. Amen? I want us to park here for a moment and talk because Jesus has made this point very clear. The people who love him will do his commandments. Now, I'm going to make a point here in a bit, or it's in the outline, and you will see it if I don't get to it. Now, let's just see if this makes sense, all right? How can you obey a commandment that you're unaware of? I guarantee you've heard this. I heard it before I went into law enforcement, and I heard it after I went into law enforcement. Ignorance is no excuse of you breaking the law or violating it. Just because you didn't know there was a law, doesn't justify you for breaking it. But now I want to, I want, this is a part of my challenge to you. This is a part of my challenge to you. Get in the word, get in the word, find out what Jesus said. Amen? For how, I don't know, for how long, eons, I've been encouraging you to get your red letter Bible. That's a simple way. There are some books out there 
but that book's going to cost you 15 to 20 dollars when you can just read it for yourself. How about that? So please, please get that in your mind. Jesus drove this point home. I mean, he talked about it over and over and over this particular night. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, don't get tired of hearing that. And if you do, just talk to Jesus about it, all right? Because he's the one that said it, and it's still very real today. Let's talk, though, about this word love. I want you to know that this family of words relates to love that relates to the will. How in the world can the Lord command us to love someone? But you cannot with the other kinds of love because they're all emotionally driven. The thing that sets apart this God kind of love is that it is a love of the will. And that's why God can command us to love our enemies. Amen? It's something that you purpose. It's something that you determine that you're going to do. And then you do it in your actions. You do it in your attitude, yes, what you want for them, what you desire for them, but also what you do to them. Now, don't forget, though, when uh, <laughs> Brother Mills, you've never seen some people I've seen. You've never had to deal with some people like I've had to deal with. Don't fool yourself. A lot of life gone into these 80 years. I've met some of the worst. I've met some of the best. Amen? And the last person who told me that I'm going to kill you, you're going to kill me one, he tried a few minutes later. I didn't pull that 38 out. <laughs> Basically, I was just trusting in the grace of God. And the only reason why I am your pastor today is because God looked out for me. Amen? Love. I don't know where Alex Bark is today. He may be dead. If he's alive, I wish him well. I certainly hope he's saved. So let me just share with you. Listen to these things. This love is the love of the will. It's the kind of love that determines to have what that person determines to have and to manifest. It involves aspiration, attitude, action. Those things, those are not just words. That's important. This kind of love has its basis in preciousness. It's a love called out of one's heart to be awakened, and have an awakened sense of value in the object love that causes one to prize it. Its impulse comes from the idea of prizing. Some of these things you may remember. It means to have a preference for, to value, to esteem, to treat with affection, to regard with strong affection. It means to love dearly, to be well pleased with, to cherish, to have high esteem for, to be satisfied with. Now, when this word's used as it was by Jesus, it involves the idea of affectionate reverence and prompt obedience. The Lord is not interested. The Lord is not interested in people just singing or preaching and saying, I love you, I love you. The Lord wants us to show it. How do we do that? By obeying what he had to say. You see, if you obey what he had to say, you really don't have to tell him you know you love him because he will know it. Amen? Where in the world did I hear this, that actions speak a lot of the words? Where did I hear that before? Did I just dream that? Did I just conjure that up? There's a lot of truth there. Actions speak louder than words. Amen? Let me give you an example. When I was a police officer, there were certain people that you just learn about. Their name is <laughs> talked about a lot. They were out of one bit of trouble and into another. 
I was very familiar with the Morris name. I knew one of the Morris brothers very well, been in his home, good friends with his son, went to church with him. Another one I knew, he was a devoted Christian. The other two were many snakes. <laughs> I'd say they're almost like an embarrassment to the devil, you know. My oldest brother and I, we had an episode with one of them one day. But now the one that was the youngest, Carlton Morris. Boy, when his name came out over the radio, everybody, everybody got tensed up because you never knew what in this world this guy was going to do. He was mean. He and his son beat beat the daughter, her boyfriend, almost to death. I, I've known this kid. I went to church with him. They beat him so badly with a steel pipe. His face, his head was distorted, disfigured so much I would never, never have recognized Kirk Martin until the person in records and identification told me the name and I said, oh my Lord. By the grace of God, he lived. But something happened. And I heard the call to Mars had gotten saved. And my first thought was, thank the Lord. But I also thought, okay, if Carlton got saved, I'm not going to hear his name mentioned so much with trouble. He's not going to send shockwaves throughout this department. Sometime after that, short time after I heard he'd gotten saved, I was in the front office. Now everybody, everybody in the whole system knew that I was a Christian. I was sitting in the front office and I saw Carlton Mars come in. And I saw a change. Here's a man who had a little disagreement with someone and ordinarily he would have beat that person to death or would have assaulted them. But he said, he comes to the police department, he says, hey, I've got this issue. Can you help me resolve this issue with this man? And I knew right then, something's happened to him. Amen. Actions speak a lot louder than words. And that's what the Lord's looking for. Several years ago, I preached the message on be do-gooders. Be do-gooders. The Bible says that him who knows to do good and does it not, it is what? It is what? It is a S-I-N. Amen. Let me proceed in this message. We're almost through here. The F used by Jesus in talking to these disciples about themselves and these commandments ought to cause us to get serious about the commands. If, if you, if you do what I say, you're my friend. If, that's a big if. Remember that Jesus gave a lot of commandments. And let me just tell you, I thought about, and I, I worked on this some. But this is a pretty big deal. He gave them more commandments than what you may realize. If you'll be here tonight, we'll work with this a little bit, and I'll show you how you can easily discover some of those commandments. If you've read the four Gospels, you have, you have read those commandments. But you may have just kind of cruised right over them, and you thought, well, he's just talking to those guys back then. No, he's talking to Rodney Davis. He's talking to Samuel Noel Myers, connected to the Lees. Talking about Charles Lloyd and James DeLong. He's talking to anybody who's going to serve him. Amen? That's serious, church. I want you to love the Lord, but the thing is that if you really love him, it should show up in who you are. Amen? He gave commandments to those original apostles, but listen now. 
He intended, he intended those commandments to be obeyed by all future disciples, including us. Now let me read to you again Matthew's account of the Great Commission. Jesus gave this, the Bible says in Matthew 28, 16, to the 11 remaining apostles sometime after his resurrection, but before his ascension. Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And now he's going to tell them how to make disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them, you are going to disciple these people by teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And then, of course, he gave them a tremendous word of consolation. And by the way, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. If you were to do a detailed study of the oral ministry of Jesus, now I didn't say oral letters. He had an interesting word, an interesting name. Nobody knew that he'd be a preacher or a preacher of worldwide fame, but people say I have oral surgery tomorrow. <laughs> well, that, that relates to the mouth, but the word oral relates to words, something that is spoken. And more, more focus, more emphasis, check me out on this, more focus, more emphasis is f placed in the New Testament, in the Gospels, on Jesus' preaching and teaching ministry than on the miracles that he did. Now, I like to see miracles. I believe in miracles. I've had miracles. Many people in here have, but let's say things the way they are. You read those red letters and you'll find that Jesus is constantly making reference to his preaching and teaching. But, now I've done all the hard work here for you, but he used a variety of words when he's referring to his oral ministry. For example, Oftentimes he talked about his word, the word, or the words. I've quoted the scripture several times already this morning where he says that Matthew 24, 35. In the course of him talking about his oral ministry, preaching and teaching, giving them uh, commandments, he used the word teaching. Luke 13, 22 is an example of that. Sayings. And one of the scriptures that I read to you earlier, John 14, 24, doctrine, John 17, 7, 16 and 17, command, John 15, 14, a scripture that I included in, and commandments, John 14, 21. Now, that's just the informational part. I want to close this message, though, I'm going to close this message by sharing this point with you. Now, I don't expect anybody to be doing any kind of backflips or swing from the chandeliers today. I wanted you to hear. I want you to hear and listen to what I'm telling you because these are the actual words of Jesus. You can't improve on that. Amen? You can't improve on that. Jesus used several action words in revealing what he expects his disciples to do regarding his oral ministry. Did you know that Jesus wants us to do something about that? I'm going to share several things with you, and these are exact words. These are words that he used. And I have used some of these words just in passing over the last few weeks. In other words, Jesus doesn't want you to just simply hear them. All right? But he does want you to hear them. So let me just, and this is kind of sequential. He said he wanted his disciples to hear what he had to say, Matthew 7, 24, to receive what he had to say, John 17, 8, to take heed to 
Mark 4, 24, to understand. Now, if, you, if you've gotten a little impatient with the pastor here in some of the detail that I've gone in recently, remember, if you, if you read Luke 24, and I just read this just the other day, Jesus used some pretty in-depth stuff. The Bible actually says that he expounded. That's the translation of the, of the King James. He is with two of his disciples after his resurrection. At this point, they have not detected who he is. So they're sad, they're bewildered over because they'd heard through the grapevine that he was uh, alive, but they didn't know that. They were still saddened. And he was wanting to know why they were saying, haven't you heard about the prophet who has been crucified and buried? Of course, when he left them, they knew who he was, but at that point they did not. But the Bible says that he expanded the scriptures to them. He explained in great detail. How many of you know that you will never know too much about the Bible? And do you know one of the things that the devil uses against people? Ignorance. And ignorance doesn't mean that you're stupid. It just means you don't know. You don't know. He wants you to understand what he has to say. Amen? Now, I talked last week at length about this next thing. He wants us to abide in the word and to have his word abiding in us. John 8, 31, John 5, 7. Now, that's pretty easy right there, okay? But he also wants us to obey. John 14, 15, and he wants us to do whatever, whatever he has commanded his disciples to do. John 15, 14. Now listen, church, I am dead serious about this. I put a lot of time on this subject. Uh, I'm working on several things, and uh, maybe I should do more. <laughs> but I'll give to you right now. If you had seen Charles Green, Davis Selby in this room here the other day, you would know that mental work is tiring and taxing. <laughs> but I love to do it. I love to study. I love to dig into the Word of God. So I'm, I'm working on a couple of projects. But hey, I can't just work on all those things because i got to help take care of you. You know, when I hear that you're on your way to surgery, you know, whatever, that you've almost broke your neck and you've got a brain concussion and you've got a crushed hip or whatever. And those things take time and they are important. So this is why I'm encouraging you. Read those red words. Get that red letter and don't get in a hurry. But if you'll be here tonight, I will help you. I will help you on your own to find some of those commandments. And then you go, hmm. why didn't I realize the Lord was speaking to me right there? This applies to me. Amen? Now, let me repeat something that I said to you earlier. I cannot believe that I've done all this much preaching in this period of time. The only way for us to know for sure how a disciple of Jesus Christ is supposed to live is to know what Jesus said to his disciples centuries or year ago. The only, thing, the only way is by knowing the commands and the commandments which he gave to them. Now let me, I've got a couple of minutes here, so let me just, and I made this comment several months ago, but a lot of water's under the bridge. Some of you were not here, and some of you may have, I don't know, not been fully alert that day, so let me remind you that Jesus gave commandments to a lot of different people. But if you'll notice, I have 
spoke only of commandments that he gave to his disciples. Now, actually, there are cases where he gave commands sometimes to just one disciple. There are times where he gave a command or commands to two disciples. There are times where he gave commands to three or four. We're not considering those. Those are isolated personal situations for that time and that place. So what we're focusing on is what he said to all of them. Also, he, he gave commandments to people who were unsaved, to the Pharisees. He gave commands to different kinds of people. So we're, we're only concerned about the commandments that Jesus gave to his followers. Amen? I want to clarify that. Now, let's say this in closing. We talked about the word Lord, that it relates to a person who is in a position of authority. During Jesus' earthly ministry, he was in a position to give commands and commandments to his disciples. How many of you know that? And he had every right to expect his disciples to obey them and to do him. Do you understand that? So it's not that your pastor's on a tear. It's not that I'm on a, a tangent. It's not that I've, you know, got an agenda. I do have an agenda, but it's not an ulterior motive. I want to preach the word to you. I want to preach the word. I want you to be the best Christian you can be and to realize your full potential. You know, there's a lot of words that I don't use that are very popular today. And I'm just about sick of them, as a matter of fact, you know. Your destiny and your purpose. Well, I'll guarantee you that if you do what Jesus said, <laughs> there are certain things that just fall right into line. Amen? As a matter of fact, one of the most significant things that Jesus said to his disciples, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things should be entered unto you. If every Christian began to live, Matthew 5, 36, 33, right now, their lives would be revolutionized. Jesus was very straightforward and direct. He said that a person who loves him will obey what he's had to say and commanded. Don't anybody leave this place and say the preacher said, and we as disciples, it doesn't matter whether you're a minister or a laity, we have an obligation to obey Jesus' commands that he gave to those first disciples to teach new converts to obey those commands also. Now let me just stop right there for a moment and just talk to you about that command. All right? Now if anybody thinks, uh, we will pray for you if, if you faint from lack of food here for a few moments. Listen, church, listen. For the moment, for right now, let's focus on one command. One command. He gave it initially to those 11 men, but if you compare that with the other accounts of the Great Commission, we know that all the members of the body of Christ, all the people of God, are to obey, to do what is in those accounts of the Great Commission. And in Matthew's account, he says, you go and you make disciples. And he tells us how to do it. By teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Well, I wish you had the time. I've got the time. <laughs> but I'm gonna, I better say something because I've already told you a lot of what I know. They, they know I'm going to have to go back and get some more knowledge here. Give me another shot or something out of here, you know, but seriously, church. Go ye therefore, make disciples, teaching them, teaching them, those new converts, to obey everything that I've commanded you. Can you imagine? How many of you know that the devil wants to keep people in the dark? I mean, if you know, he does not want them to know the truth. 
Now listen, church, I don't have a patent on this. I don't have a copyright on this. I will probably at some point do some writing on it or that will be published, but that this is in the Word of God. Amen? It, it, this is what the Lord wants for us today. Amen? And don't let the devil tell you that you can't be a witness for the Lord, or that you can't testify for him. Amen? And I tell you what will always work if you're trying to help somebody. Just get that red letter Bible down and say, hey, brother, just look right here. Just look right here. This is what Jesus Christ wants from you. Listen here, sis. This is what Jesus Christ wants from you. This is what he is expecting. Oh, I, I was, I, I'm going to take a couple of moments. You see, the word disciple means what? Say that again. Learner. How does a disciple learn? By being taught. That's why Jesus, one of the numerous titles that he has is teacher. Teacher. And he said, one of the commands, actually the two commands here together, two commands in this one verse, and I quoted this just the other day. Take my yoke upon you. That's a command. And learn from me. So, in discipling, you don't have to come up with a program or with a plan. We disciple people by telling them what Jesus said. So simple. And the whole concept here and the ancient world of discipling. And Jesus used this very same thing. The original teacher chose people who were interested in learning, but who were committed to him, who would learn his teachings, but who were committed, first of all, are you, are you ready for this? To live their lives according to his teaching. Does that ring a bell? Jesus doesn't say we've got to come up with our own standard or our own concepts. You tell people to live, follow my example. They also not only had to commit to live their lives according to the teaching of their master, their teacher, but they also were obligated to perpetuate in other words, to pass it on to other people. Now let me just give you something to think about and then we're going to stop. There are people who think that the Christian church is off its rocker. They think the church has lost its way. That we need to scratch everything we're doing. As another term that I'm absolutely sick of, paradigm, paradigm shift. They're telling young preachers hey, everything we're doing is the wrong way. That's why they got the strobe lights. That's, that's, that's why they got the blinking lights. And that's why they're seeing it looks like a, a club, a nightclub. This is the whole idea behind this, you know. And when you get people in the building, don't talk about Jesus and don't have a cross and don't talk about sin and about judgment. It'll make them feel uncomfortable. This is what's going on in America. And a matter of fact, some of you may have visited some churches where they, but listen, listen. The church grows through birth. And then by us nurturing that babe in Christ, establishing them, amen? And you may get saved on milk, but you will grow and mature on the strong meat of the word. And you've heard some of that today. Amen? Somebody say, Pew. pause, put a period right there. <laughs> I wonder if we could just sing another song or two. And let me just, um, 
while they're coming, let me just tell you something and listen carefully to what I'm saying. We have some precious people in this church who their hearts are here today and they would love very much to be here. And I talked to one of those people this week. I, I've been in her home 